Community Hotline is made possible with generous support by Quick Lane, located at Gresham Ford. Life is better in the Quick Lane, now serving all makes and models, foreign and domestic. The Outlook, serving the residents of East Multnomah County for more than 100 years. The region's number one source for information, the Outlook provides readers with intensely local coverage of the issues and people that impact our lives and community. The Mount Hood Cable Regulatory Commission, advocating on behalf of the public interest on communications policy issues at the local, state, and federal levels. And by Stamp Connection and BeFit Gyms. A very special thanks to all the sponsors who help make our programming possible. Hi, I'm Monica Weitzel, the host of Community Hotline. Here at Metro East, we know you care about local schools, government, and all the issues that affect you, from social justice to health concerns. We bring you this program to help you learn more about those issues and introduce you to resources that can make a difference. Tonight, we'll begin by speaking with the Gresham Barlow School District. You may be aware of new construction and facility upgrades taking place in the district due to the passage of a recent bond. In determining how that money should be spent, the district found that the biggest concern of parents was school safety. We'll share with you exactly what is being done to address that concern. And then we'll talk with the Mount Hood chapter of Oregon Equestrian Trails. If you ride horses or think it might be a fun activity to explore, you'll want to watch this interview. OET has been successfully working to protect, maintain, and build Oregon's equestrian trails. But that's only part of their work. Find out what they can offer you, your friends, and your family. Please join us for tonight's interviews, coming up next on Community Hotline. Hi, and welcome to Community Hotline. I'm Monica Weitzel. We're here in Gresham at Metro East Community Media. Thanks for joining us tonight. We're going to start off tonight's show talking with the Gresham Barlow School District. Specifically, we'll talk with the Director of, uh, or the Director of District Safety, Kevin Sutherland. It's great to have you here. Thank you, Monica. Good yeah. evening. Good evening. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about some of the things that are going on at Gresham Barlow. I know that um, a couple of years ago, there was a, a bond passed mm -hmm. that gave a lot of money to the school district to do a lot of different things. And some of the things I believe were um, they were going to upgrade classrooms. Mm -hmm. And um, let's see, what are some, what are the, some of the things they did? They had to modernize them, make um, technology available to a lot more kids, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I know that they were um, renovating and replacing a lot of the schools mm -hmm. as well. But one of the things that that came up over and over again from what I understand were community dis mm -hmm. discussions with parents in the community is uh, school safety. Yeah. And that's really been something that's been mm -hmm. on everybody's mind for the last few years then, since things got ugly in, in the schools when, when uh, you know, people decided that, you know, that it, it's not a safe place anymore. And that's a sad thing yeah. that, that they're not. But because of that, um, Obviously, changes have to be made. Mm -hmm. Now, you were just hired last year, correct, as yes. a director of mm -hmm. district safety. So, what what does your job exactly entail? Okay, I uh, I come into the district and I'm really working on uh, enhancing safety and security. Uh, the district is very safe, very good protocols. But as you mentioned, on the 2016 bond, with all of the construction and what we would call the physics of things or mm -hmm. target hardening, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, we're also looking at the psychology of things or how mm -hmm. things operate and how people um, interface with systems and really do that. So my job is to work on that, develop some training 
uh, roll that training out, make sure everything is standard, that I collaborate with our community partners, right. Gresham Police, Fire Emergency Management, the Sheriff's Office in Multnomah County and Clackamas County. So all first responders. All of really. the first responders yeah. and really make sure that we um, continue to work on our great partnerships and we do have really great partnerships and when we get together to do training and do different things then we have those folks at the table with us so if something uh, has to be responded to um, we're not meeting people for the first time as we're trying to work through issues. You already have that relationship yeah. which is so important and there's so many different people that have to be involved but getting together and meeting at least you're all mm -hmm. on the same page right yes yeah, yeah yeah that would be really important so what were some of the um, main things as far as physical facility mm -hmm. uh, changes and upgrades that are being made with that bond money as far as safety and security goes mm -hmm. well and and I I like to call it improving our SAT score <laughs> and it's not the testing SAT score yeah. but it's surveillance or natural su surveillance access control and territoriality and those are all kind of from crime prevention through environmental design. The three things that were specifically called out on the bond are limiting access uh, points in the schools, okay. um, modern emergency communication equipment, and then locking door, uh, classroom doors so, so teachers, inside. teachers and staff can lock the doors yeah. from the inside. Yeah. So those three things were specifically called out. We have secured the perimeter of all the schools with, with a couple of exceptions due to construction. Okay. Uh, and you have to approach the front door, uh, ring a doorbell, then staff greets you, identifies who you are. Um, you come in through a vestibule. You have a conversation with the staff, sign in, and then get a visitor's badge. Okay. And we're really trying to make sure uh, that we follow those kind of fundamental steps to enhance um, safety and security. So none of those uh, situations where you say, oh, yeah, come on in, you know, trusting that they are who they say they are because you don't know. You right, don't you know. don't know. Yeah. And, and we can hold them there until we can verify uh, who's doing it okay. and kind of follow the protocols. If they're uncertain, then they just don't open the door. Okay, that, yeah. that, that's good to hear. Now you brought a, a video, Kevin. What, mm -hmm. uh, would this be a good time to take a look at that video? It's, I think you said it was kind of an overview yeah. of some kind. Yeah. What, what exactly will we be looking at in this? Oh, well, we're going to see uh, what we talked about, the three things that were called out okay. specifically on the bond, and then we're going to look and see a little bit of the collaborations we're doing with police and fire. Then we're going to also see uh, also a great partnership that we have with Concordia University's Homeland mm. Security Lab where we're doing some training. Um, and then we're going to also see a surprise picture at the end of the video, but I'm not going to do oh. a spoiler. <laughs> okay, okay, great. I can't wait to see it. Oh, I think we should go ahead and roll that now. Well, that 
that gives us a good a good feel for a lot of the things that you're that you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, the as far as the um, you, you have the locks in the buildings, you're limiting the access, and yeah. then the radios. Yeah, is that what this is here? Yeah, this is an example of the handheld radio, and on the video you got to see a desk top unit. Uh -huh. And if you think of each school and think of a school as the center hub in a wagon wheel. Okay. Um, the schools have internal radio communications. They have their cell phones. They have their public address system. Right. All different ways of communicating internal to the school. And then a unique thing is with the bond, we were able then to get a district, uh, kind of what I would call a WAN or a wide area network for radios. Mm -hmm. So we can, at the district, call and reach every school mm. and department. So you saw a, a while ago, uh, for example, that Beaverton School District had to do, they did a district-wide lockout. Right, well, right. Now we can do that by just calling on the radio and instantaneously get all the schools to do a lockout or whatever they need to do. It's a lot we, faster, I'm sure, than oh, whatever it was done before. Yeah, no, it's incredible. Yeah. And if you have a student that's out on a field trip on a bus, we can also reach out through the transportation department and anywhere the bus is in the Pacific Northwest have radio communication wow. with them. So that should give people peace of mind. Yes, yes. Uh, that, that's, and we're really that's proud great. of that. Yeah. yeah. Well, and so I assume then the, the, the desk uh, radio, whatever, would be mm -hmm. in like in the administrative office or something like that. And then, yes. and then who all has the radio? Then? Yeah, the um, administrators have radios. Mm -hmm. And then people that have supervisory duty within the school. So, for example, in the morning when you're arriving on the bus, uh -huh. walking, biking, yeah. however getting to school, people that are out doing supervision have a radio. Custodial yeah. staff have a radio. The administrators have a radio. And the campus monitors have a radio. Okay. And so their team inside the school, they can operate off of four different channels mm -hmm. and kind of do everything that they need to do. And then, in, like you mentioned, in the office, we have the base station radio right. that's set on the district channel at all times. And the other radios have the capability that if um, you're an administrator at the building, we can communicate with all of them at one time as well as the schools. So wow. the handheld radio will pick up that channel as well. And I think it creates a really effective radio network. Yeah. And I would point out also uh, that the school resource officers also mm -hmm. have the radios. I was going to ask about that. Uh, yeah. And they then have they the same, have their same channels. Like yeah, just, they, yeah. So we can yeah. coordinate um, over this radio or over the police radio, 800 megahertz radios. Who are the campus monitors? Are they, are they uh, staff? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, their staff and, and their role and function is to provide that layer of safety and security eyes out in the hallways, getting to know the students, providing um, support. And I, I will say uh, that they're DPSST trained, which is Department of Public Safety Standards and Training okay. for unarmed private security professionals. Uh, they have to go right. through training, testing. Like security guards uh, do. Yeah, the yeah. Security so guards, yeah. Um, they have that level of professionalism. Good. And as you saw in the video, we're kind of enhancing that training. And now all the campus uh, monitors are trained in um, how to apply a tourniquet or how to do the national stop the bleed uh, thing. And I think that we found that that training was very valuable. Yeah, it used to be that first aid was mostly the, yeah. you know, somebody having a heart attack yeah. or, or whatever, but yeah. mm -hmm. and, and it's sad that we feel the need to do that, but we do mm -hmm. need to do that. But, and that's I think what people think about first when they think about uh, school security is, is um, you know, a, a shooter situation, mm -hmm. something like that. But there's also natural disasters. I mean, yes. how, how does that play into your security and safety yeah. um, protocol? Well, that's an excellent setup and segue for uh, our emergency protocols, and we've adopted is that uh, what the, this is? the standard response protocol, uh -huh. and there are four things that you can do, and it's a multi-hazard so uh, approach to doing it. So a lockout is if something bad is happening outside, and we bring everyone inside, lock all the doors, you and keep business as usual. Out. Yeah. And keep all the kids in. Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. And, Lock, and the teachers. Yeah. Okay. Lockdown is something bad is in the building and locks lights out of sight. 
Uh, and then, as you mentioned, for other things, mm -hmm. evacuation, and the most common one that we practice for is fire drills. Yes. You know, the kids are yeah. very good at evacuating the building and, and doing a fire uh, drill. Yeah. Uh, another one, you see um, there is also shelter. So if you uh, do the great shakeout and, uh, you know, drop cover and hold on yeah. it is a sheltering. And then oftentimes after you do that shelter, you evacuate. So as we use those four protocols, they can really cover the whole gamut of everything mm. you're talking about Good. from weather, broken water pipe, whatever the case may be. So do you have these signs throughout the facility? Yes. Yeah. And, yeah. and uh, staff uh, and students are trained every year in the protocol. Good. And then we do some drills and rehearsals with all of these, but those yeah. posters are up in all the classrooms. Good. Good. Yeah. Notice of missing extra or injured students. I mean, yeah, bring your phone, leave the other stuff behind. I mean, those are, you know, mm -hmm. in a, in a, if you see it often enough, yeah. you're going to remember it. And, and Hopefully we're, that's the situation. Yeah, I, I think so. And we're really trying to embrace um, situational awareness, training everyone to look around, be aware of what's going on, right. life safety, and then option-based decision-making. And everyone kind of wonders about that. Yeah. But as a driver, you do that every day. Okay. Imagine yourself mm -hmm. driving your car mm -hmm. and you're coming up to an intersection. The light goes to yellow. What do you do? Do I go through or can I, do I stop? Yeah. <laughs> right. So how close am I? Yeah. yeah. You have to make those. Snap right. You have to make decisions. those decisions. And yeah. it's, it's yeah. the same as you're going around and, and we're talking and focusing on community safety. It's not just when you're at school. Mm -hmm. It's as we talked earlier, uh, when you go shopping, you go to the mall, uh, Clackamas Town Center, you go to a movie theater, uh, Aurora, or, or you go anywhere where there are groups, groups and of crowds people. of people. You need to be aware of your yeah. environment, and those protocols can follow you wherever you go. So once you learn them, it's going to help you be safer yeah. wherever. Yeah. yeah. It's, like, it's like kids finally, you know, understanding that I, the car doesn't move till the seatbelt's on, you know. It's like be, <laughs> let it become part of their lifestyle, yeah. and it will, it will help them. Right. So how do you go about training, um, you know, the teachers and the students? I mean, I understand mm -hmm. teacher, or students can have the fire drills. I remember yeah. have many, many fire drills. I mean, when I was a kid, we did the get under the desk for mm -hmm. the, uh, oh, yeah. the, you know, when the Cold War was yes. going on, you know, that was, yeah. that was something you had to think about. But um, things have changed and there was a little mm -hmm. different, different things. So do the kids, do they get scared when, or do they, does this reassure them to learn these safety, the safety measures? Mm -hmm. No, I think it's reassuring. And if you go in it kind of with a trauma informed uh, view and you have conversation like we're having, explain it to them in very age appropriate ways. And then you slowly kind of walk through things uh -huh. and, and you, you go through it. And if you do a drill or do something, um, you talk about it before, mm -hmm. um, during, and then after, after. and make sure uh, that you address anyone's concerns because everyone comes to something uh, with a different set of baggage. And right. if anyone right. had been in a fire before and the fire alarm goes off, that may be sure, upsetting for them. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So I think if we're aware of that and we're really trying to focus on um, trying to build some resiliency in the fact that um, if something happens, you have a set of options and things that you can do mm -hmm. in the option-based decision-making. Because really what we're trying to do, and we're, we're not teaching the smaller kids, but staff, mm -hmm. we're having conversations about what happens to you when you get put under pressure. So mm -hmm. things happen, right? Like you picture your car and someone is almost hitting you. Yeah. What's gonna happen? Your heart rate's gonna go up. Mm -hmm. You may get some auditory exclusion you may start getting some oh. tunnel vision mm -hmm. and you may lose a little yeah. bit of fine motor skills. So if we rehearse ahead of time, teach people how to take four calming breaths, move their head around, and then do one of the actions, we've preloaded them for success. Oh, and they're not gonna kind of freeze in that fight or flight. And it's really empowering them with their situational awareness and life safety and their toolkit of options of what can I do. 
That's, that is empowering, and that's, yeah. a, that's a great thing. You, you use the term um, trauma-informed, and mm -hmm. that's kind of a buzzword now. I hear, yeah. I hear that a lot. What does that mean when you're talking about um, kids, when, or talking about working with kids? Mm -hmm. When you say you're um, trauma-informed, that, that, are you referring to the training that you do with the, the uh, teachers and administrators so that they know how to deal with children that have you know, undergone different kinds of trauma? What, you know, mm -hmm. Just explain that to well, me. Well, for, for me, as a layperson, I rely on the mental health experts to help mm -hmm. me out with that, to do the heavy lifting. What it means to me is, like, if I'm going to do a training and I'm dealing with staff and we're going to show a video that shows something, that I have a conversation ahead of time, that what we're going to see is graphic. Mm -hmm. If you're coming to this with um, any kind of issues about this or whatever, Please feel free that you don't have to watch. You can get up and leave the room. Right. If when you're watching, you need to leave, you can. Or if you need to talk to someone, you can. Okay. And really just dealing with it um, up front. And I can't give you a more technical answer. No, that's good. That's that. good. That's, that's a good yeah. explanation, actually. Because, yeah, yeah, that, then the kids have permission to have those feelings or to have right. those reactions and that it's okay to deal with them yeah. however they need to deal with them. And in difficult conversations, and some of this, this is not comfortable for anyone. No. Um, but it's just something that we have to slowly, bit by bit, talk about it. Because if we ignore it, it's not going to go away. Right. And then if it pops up, then we're caught. And we may not, ha you know, yeah. our Rolodex in our mind is not ready to, to tool us for success and to win. How can uh, we in the community, whether we are mm -hmm. business people here or, or just residents or you know parents, how can we help the schools to um, with their their goals to have a good, safe, and secure school, schools? Mm -hmm. I mean, I know that that you must partner with a lot of different organizations. Yeah. Obviously, you mentioned fire and mm -hmm. and um, police that you know for your communications, mm -hmm. but. Um, you know, say there is a, you know, say there's an earthquake mm -hmm. and your kid's at school, what's the best thing for a parent to do or, you know, what's the best thing to do to, you know, because I'm sure everybody wants to run there, mm -hmm. grab their kids and, you know, you get all sorts of problems that can result from everybody trying to, to be there in yeah. the middle of something. Do you have any advice for, mm -hmm. for people and how to handle those kind of situations? Yeah, sure. I would say that, that, you know, take care of your personal preparedness and readiness, mm -hmm. have some food and water at home. And the buzz that we're trying to teach is um, stay home, stay informed, and be ready. So you're staying at home so you're not coming to the school and creating a, a bigger yeah, health and safety issue. And, or whatever, right. yeah. mm -hmm. and then we're partnering with media and we have different communication outlets, so we're really gonna try and get in, in front of things using the media, using our mass communication systems, our auto dialers, social media, and pushing messages out with our community partners, police, fire, emergency management. And then if we, uh, when we're ready to have the parents come to do a reunification or to pick mm -hmm. up their kids or something, we'll clearly communicate that out. Okay. And so parents and community members can keep their information updated and accurate with the school. Very so, important. Yeah, yeah, sign up for all the emergency alert information that they can get and then um, stay tuned and be ready to um, follow the information that's put out. Because number one, we want to make sure all the kids and staff are safe, mm -hmm. and we want to make sure that parents and significant others are safe traveling uh, right, to the school right. to pick up their right. their student. And they want, and when the kids go home, they want you want yeah. them to have a safe place there too. So, exactly. so I imagine you encourage the families to have their own safety plans mm -hmm. and you know be prepared. You know, have your have your extra water and and be you know listening to the news and and mm -hmm. you know keeping informed. So, is there anything else that we should know about about the safety and security um, protocol that's going on at Gresham Barlow before I let you go here? Mm -hmm. Well, I think if if everyone can can be involved, and I think that we had talked about it before, creating that safer climate. Mm -hmm. And and I would be remiss if I didn't thank all the voters for voting for the 2016 bond. Yes. So big huge. shout yes. out. Yeah, that's <laughs> fantastic. Uh, but stay engaged. If they 
see something, say something, if they hear something, say something, especially with social media and different things where right. things are popping up. Like if somebody is making comments that are sure. that are indicating there may be an issue with that yeah. person. Yeah. Making a threat or yeah. doing some kind of concerning at-risk behavior, and then that way we can get that information uh, to the right source. Uh, there is the safe Oregon tip line uh, that they can people can call anonymously for that. And I, and I think that if if we're just building community, building relationships, and taking care of each other, uh, we're creating that safer climate. Perfect. Yeah. Great, great way to end that interview. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Kevin. I really appreciate it. Thank oh. you, Monica. I appreciate it. Oh, thanks. And thanks for watching this first segment of Community Hotline. I've learned something. I hope you have, too. So pay attention to what he said. Check out the Gresham Barlow website. Uh, you'll find out more information there and um, be safe. I'll be right back with more of Community Hotline. Community Hotline is made possible with generous support by Quick Lane, located at Gresham Ford. Life is better in the Quick Lane, now serving all makes and models, foreign and domestic. The Outlook, serving the residents of East Multnomah County for more than 100 years. The region's number one source for information, The Outlook provides readers with intensely local coverage of the issues and people that impact our lives and community. The Mountain Hood Cable Regulatory Commission, advocating on behalf of the public interest on communications policy issues at the local, state, and federal levels. And by Stamp Connection and BeFit Gyms. A very special thanks to all the sponsors who help make our programming possible. Metro East plays a vital role in strengthening community life by helping nonprofit organizations share their story. One major opportunity we offer is Community Hotline, our weekly talk show that highlights the stories of our community's nonprofit organizations. We've had a lot of people call Ride Connection because they've seen us on Community Hotline. We can reach people that I've never thought about reaching out to. We can get that word out to a broad audience quickly. The list of causes and nonprofits that we support is really incredible. Do you know a nonprofit you'd like to see on Community Hotline? We'd love to have them on the show. Give us a call. Hi, and welcome back to Community Hotline. I'm Monica Weitzel. We're here in Gresham at Metro East Community Media. Now we're going to be talking with Oregon Equestrian Trails. And here to represent the organization, I have Barb Adams. You are the Mount Hood um, Chapter Chair. Correct. Good to have you here. And Linda Lasowski, you are a super OET volunteer, <laughs> from what I'm told. Uh-oh. Super volunteer, <laughs> that's a great title. You should have worn a cape. Um, <laughs> so it's, <great. laughs> it's really good to have both of you here. <clears throat> so tell me, the Oregon Equestrian Trails has been around for, since 1970, I believe, right? That's correct. That's a very long time. Mm -hmm. So tell me how it got started, if you can. Maybe a little, little brief history of um, why the organization was started and what you did. So in 1970, the, uh, there were members of the posse. Who, who built the original uh, Timothy or uh, Riley horse camp up at Mount Hood National Forest. The posse being, what is that? A posse is like a sheriff's posse. Yeah, so it was a sheriff's posse that did it? Okay. Yeah, some of the sheriff's okay. posses. Okay. And, and they saw that there were trails being closed to equestrians and that equestrians had always ridden on. And so they formed a group and they named it Oregon Equestrian Trails and the 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 idea was to support keeping equestrians on trails. Why were they being closed? 
You know, I'm not quite <coughs> sure. I wonder if it was, um, I mean, because this would not be private property. This would be this would public be, lands, Well, right? it may have been private property. Okay. And, and uh, that early history, you know, is a little bit fuzzy. I think what happened in our organization is people didn't write down the specifics, and then pretty soon all the founders are gone. All right, And right. you don't have all the specifics of of yeah. what they yeah, it's been a while formed. It's been a while. But basically yeah. it was horse lovers, horse, <coughs> horse enthusiasts who wanted to have a place where you could ride your horse. And, and would they have ever thought that, you know, this many years later it would still be going uh, on? Uh, you know, they might have thought, oh, this is a, you know, a temporary thing we're doing to try to, you know, open up more. the horse trails and we'll be done. <laughs> but yeah, I'm not sure. But we'll celebrate our 50th anniversary next year. That's great. Congratulations. Yeah. That's wonderful. So. Uh, now, the, obviously, the Oregon Equestrian Trail still um, keeps the trails open and, and maintains them. Is that right? Well, one of the big things that we do is we work with agencies, county agencies, state parks, federal agencies. Okay. Any agency that deals with trails that horses use, we work with. So we have 15 chapters all over the state. And so each chapter works with certain horse camps, certain agencies, like the Mount Hood chapter works with the Mount Hood National Forest. Okay, that makes and sense. And then we work with the uh, Columbia River Gorge National Scenic Area. Oh, so okay. those are the two agencies we work with right now. We, at times, we have worked with four different agencies, going as far south as Triangle Lake to open trails. Wow. And, and working on the Pacific Crest Trail. And so, you work basically by geographic area, but you can work with other chapters. And right now we're forming more partnerships, like with Pacific Crest Trail Association, working with Trail Keepers of Oregon, working with Backcountry Horsemen. And so a lot of our effort does go into trails, clearing trails, maintaining trails, working on tread. So do you have big work parties to do this, is it? Well, <laughs> we do have work <coughs> parties to do it. And, and the nice thing is, is when you spend all day working on a trail, like mm -hmm. we go into the Salmon Huckleberry Wilderness, you spend all day working on a trail. But then you get done, and you get on your horse, and, and you get a nice ride out yeah. and, a and get to and, a and, get, <laughs> and get to admire so, mm -hmm. everything that you've done, and then we sit down at the trailhead or wherever yeah. we come in, and we have snacks. And sometimes we do go in on foot. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Linda, tell me about about what you've done. Have you worked on this trail clearing and, and worked I on have. the trails? Yeah. But I've, since you're a super volunteer, I have a feeling you've done more than that. <laughs> and I was the, the parade person for, we've been in the Gresham Teddy Bear Parade for <sighs> How many years? Eleven years yeah? now. Yeah, good. And um, so I and was, I've probably I seen you a, every year because <laughs> mm -hmm. I've worked here eleven years. <laughs> yes. And, and, uh, yes, yeah. we've been in it for eleven years straight, and we've also been in a couple of Fourth of July parades, one in Estacada mm -hmm. and one in Corbett. We've been yeah, to that that's one. Yeah, that's a big, big one. I understand. Yeah. And I mean, we just love to get out and let people. Well, everybody See likes to the watch horses the horses and, the and get our I mean, name that's out so there saying, you know, we we help maintain yeah. the trails that you enjoy, you know, and we love them. So sounds like you um, you have a lot of fun. I mean, we do. So, so tell me when you like you were saying the trail thing and then afterwards you have a potluck or something. Mm -hmm. How many people would be working on something like that? On well, it depends. <coughs> Usually we'd like a minimum of six and it depends on where we're at, too. Yeah. But we've had probably as many as twenty yeah. on some of our work parties yeah. when we go into the when we go into the wilderness. But um, a lot of our work right now for the Mount Hood chapter is down at the Sandy River Delta in the Columbia mm. River Gorge. Okay. And beautiful area. Yeah. Beautiful area. Beautiful yeah. area. And we've ridden down there for more than twenty years. We took the Forest Service recreation people for a horseback ride down there about 22 years really? ago when yeah. they asked us they mm -hmm. asked us what should we do with the sandy river delta and we said well we'll come and take you for a horseback ride oh, that's a perfect yeah. idea yeah. <laughs> like, see this is what we do this yeah. is what we think needs uh -huh. to be done and so we do a lot of education and a lot of uh, trail work down there you brought a few pictures too yes maybe we could take a look at some of those that would be give a good us idea a, you know, a feeling yeah. for what this is This is all yeah. about. Okay, so this is a Douglas Trailhead. Yeah. Okay, the Douglas Trailhead 
is should I face this way? Or? Either way, Look at you're that. fine. Okay. So the Douglas Trailhead is in the Mount Hood National Forest Salmon Huckleberry Wilderness. This trailhead is on Wildcat Mountain. There used to be a quarry there, and they had so much trouble with vandalism and people pushing stolen cars off the edge that they finally oh, destroyed gee. the quarry. And this is the new trailhead. That's beautiful. And we've been working at this trailhead since 2001. Uh, not, not the, the new trailhead and the old trailhead. And you can get on this trail and you can do a 26 mile loop wow. using five different trails. And it's a, since it's wilderness, it's a hiker horse loop. And when we used to log this trail out, you can only use hand tools because it's wilderness. Oh. And so you use crosscut saws and you can use axes. Wow. You can use hand tools. You cannot use chainsaws in the wilderness. And I most like of that. the crews <laughs> that we work, ran <laughs> were wilderness crews using the crosscut saws wow. and the axes. And the, oh, and this <laughs> this is play day. Play so, day. Yeah. Play day. So we do events like running around with a flag and with an egg and spoon and, uh, and just and fun games. Things. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> so basically, yeah. it's a game day. <clears throat> <clears throat> and then we have prizes and we have a big potluck. So no work, that's just a day no, job. No, just have a good a, time. A fun yeah. day. And yeah. one of our members donates the arena and the site. Oh, great. So we don't have any, barely any expenses connected to it. That's, yeah. That sounds like a lot of fun. Well, you, gotta, you gotta have days where you just yeah. play, right? And this oh, is the Sandy goodness. River Delta, where we were just talking about yeah, how much work yeah. we do there. And this is a, a ride. People just come down, park their horse trailers, and then we all go for a ride. Now, can anybody join in this on joining on a ride, or you need to be a member of the club? Well, if you're club? not, uh, it, Don members do come. Okay, like make, maybe they want to just check it out. For yeah, a, and yeah. basically they would have to sign a release form okay, in fair, order yeah. to ride with us. But if somebody keeps showing up all the time, we do expect them to join. Yeah, that makes sense. That's, reason, that's a reasonable expectation. Yeah. And this is also at the Sandy River Delta, and we were working on a trail. And there's a lot of dog walkers at the Sandy River Delta, and we're partners with Friends of the Sandy River Delta. We're only two groups that are focused on recreation at the Sandy River Delta wow. recreation site, and that's Oregon Equestrian Trails and Friends of the Sandy River Delta. And so naturally, we bring our dogs when we come and work the trail. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, dogs and horses, they just kind of <laughs> yeah. go together, don't they? Like, um, they like do that you picture talk, illustrates. Do you want to talk about the education? <laughs> well, this is from uh, also at the Sandy River Delta. It's our what we call Puppies and Ponies Day. <laughs> I was going to say that's either and, a really huge dog or a really small yeah, horse. And, yeah, <laughs> and that's Little C, the, pony, oh. the mini horse there. And he is very friendly and gets along with the dogs and we t in tell people how to introduce their dog to a horse oh, yeah. and there's we bring little horses and big horses and the big ones go out on the trails and the little ones pretty much stay in Sick. the parking lot yeah. and we drive them around so oh, they shoot. get to see oh. them wherever. And so you are able to introduce children also to yes. how to uh -huh. how to approach an yes. animal because that's a good thing uh -huh. to learn. And this is, we do a tremendous amount of work on horse camps. OET has built more than 40 horse camps wow. in the state of Oregon. And we build, this is an interesting thing about the equestrians. The equestrians build their own camps. Now, sometimes the Forest Service supplies the materials. Sometimes everybody pitches in. But, you know, the, if you're a regular camper, you don't build your own camp. Right. The equestrians actually build their own camps. So explain this to me because I, I used to camp all the time. I haven't for a while, but I've never been to a horse camp. Mm -hmm. What is different about a horse camp? You had the corrals. Okay. And, uh, and so this is Riley Horse Camp, which was built by the original right. members, the Posse yeah. Group up in Mount Hood National Forest. I can't remember the date right now. So but is the Mount Hood chapter the very first chapter? No. No, no. okay. No. We're one of the later chapters, oh, okay, actually. Okay. We were formed in, oh God, 1997. Okay, okay. So we're one of the later chapters. So we worked on this camp, rebuilding all of the corrals and putting in new corrals. And we worked, uh, Backcountry Horsemen actually headed it up with the Forest Service. Both groups put in money, and, and both groups and the Forest Service, we all worked in it together to put up the corrals. 
So um, horse camps are built for horses. So we try, the Forest Service tries to discourage non-horse people from coming to a horse camp because the, we can't go into a regular camp. With your horses. With our right. horses. So, but this is a place where you do camp. I mean, are mm -hmm. there, are yes. you do tent, tent camp? Are there cabins? What is well, it? Well, no, there's no cabins. Okay. People bring tents or they bring okay. RVs. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, so it is one you could maybe drive yeah. into if you mm -hmm. Right, to. But, but it's a place that you can come and bring your horse. And then you can also do dispersed camping, which is where you just find a site out in the forest, and then you put up a rope between two trees and you highline your horse. Call and that's good, legal huh? in the forest, yeah. too. So uh, you were, I heard about your organization from Jessica Holiday, who's one of my um, coworkers, mm -hmm. and she owns donkeys. Do they allow donkeys on the horse trails? Mm -hmm. Oh yes. So yeah. that's they're not they're not disallowed from being on the horse uh, trails. No donkeys, llamas. Uh, you could walk an alpaca. There was a camel at McIver State Park. Really? Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. So wow, <laughs> that was exciting. That would be a little <laughs> yeah. bit different. Right? And so for, and there there aren't just horse trails. Every horse trail is open to hikers. Okay. And some of them are non-motorized trails, so you have hikers, horses, and bicyclists. Mm, okay. And then that's part of the education, too, is bicyclists need to know how to meet a horse, mm -hmm. and horses need to know how to beat a bicycle. So part of our training, part of my personal training with my horse, was to take bicycles and, and train him not to be afraid of them. And we work with other groups, bicycle groups, mm -hmm. on training horses and yeah. people on bicy bicycles how to meet each other. And then uh, I used to do road riding, and my horse was not afraid of what logging kind of riding was on the road, oh, along the road. Oh, road riding. Okay. And my horse was not afraid of motorcycles or logging trucks or buses. He was just... That's the kind solid. of horse you want in a parade, right? Yeah, but right. but our group doesn't. Uh, you know, we don't do that sort of riding. We do yeah. trail riding. Yeah. Huh. So I imagine there's a, a certain um, etiquette for riding the trails with horses and and um, bicyclists. I mean, you so the to... etiquette, the formal etiquette, and it's a triangle sign. I didn't bring one, but the formal etiquette is that um, hikers and bicycles yield to horses. And bicycles yield to hikers and horses. So right. basically, bicycles are supposed to yield to everyone. Yeah, they're the they're the bottom Bicy of the totem pole as far as that goes. And bicycles so. <laughs> and hikers are supposed to yield to horses. But it very much depends on the trail you're on, the width of the trail, mm -hmm. uh, the the yeah. park you're in. Right. So that right. does. But if you're on a single track, you know, a two yeah. foot wide that's, in the mountains. That's the format there. Then. Yeah. Everybody yields to the horse because you don't want the horse off of that the trail. The horse does more damage off the trail oh, I'm sure. than a person walking mm. or a bicycle. Yeah. Yeah. And their feet just right. Can, well, right. and it's more dangerous. Yeah. Well, I was going to say that's not good yeah. for the horse and either. Probably. One thing we try and teach people is when they approach a seahorse that's on the trail. They always tuck behind a tree. <laughs> so, oh, really? the bicyclists or the hiker? Yeah, both. yeah. both okay. They think, you know, they <laughs> and they'll separate and go to two sides of the trail and hide behind trees. And we always say, could you please show yourselves in one uh. side or the other? You know, so the horse doesn't feel trapped. Yeah, yeah. Between and all of a sudden see this person. Appear mm -hmm. behind right, a right. tree. That makes sense. And, and so. it's and we tell them to talk to the horse because the horse, when the horse hears the human voice, mm -hmm. then the horse feels comforted. Yeah. By hearing the mm -hmm. human yeah. voice, and so we get we start talking to people, and they talk back, and then the horse is happy because that's the horse a, yeah. hears the yeah. human voice. That's a good thing to know. Yeah. That's okay. one thing. I, I'm um, a member of the Soroptimus who put on the teddy bear mm -hmm. parade every year, and and we were talking not very long ago, and they said. The, one of the first things they learned in putting on the parades is you don't put the horses behind the bands, or don't put the bands behind the horses. No, yeah. <laughs> you don't want no. the bands behind yeah. the horses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they said at first that was one of the mistakes they made. They just yeah. didn't think about that, that those loud noises could really spook the yeah. horses. Yeah, they're the better thing. in front, yeah. the horses behind, Yeah, yeah. so they can chase it along. <laughs> right, right, but not have it coming out from yeah. behind. Yeah. One thing yeah. interesting about horses, though, is <clears throat> horses are trained for wars. They mm -hmm. can do 
just astonishing things. Mm -hmm. They're amazing animals, um, aren't they? And get used to a, a yeah. lot of yeah. things. Yeah. Yeah. And so one thing that all our members share is a deep love of horses. Mm -hmm. yeah. Linda, and how did you um, how how did you start loving horses? Do you remember? I don't ever remember not yeah. putting. It was the first thing on my Christmas list every I year. I want a pony for a, Christmas. A is that or? even though I live down on. <laughs> deep southeast portland and there was no um, way to have a horse there so you I own horses one. now you own or I, a, or I, a horse or? i own two i own one miniature horse that i drive and i have one full-size riding horse that's so, so great and how about you well i uh, we got a pony when i was five she did get a pony when she was we five we grew up on a farm <laughs> and we had my <laughs> grandpa had draft horses <laughs> yeah and so, and I begged for a horse, and I got a horse when I was a freshman in high school, and yes. I've had horses ever since. Wow, yeah. Draft horses are really big ones, right? Yes, and yeah. they're quite yeah. gentle. Yeah. Now, I notice you're both wearing the, um, the shirts, the mm -hmm. Mount Head chapter shirts, and this is, uh, I wanted to show this, because they're cute on the front, but they're really cute on the back. Maybe we can get a, a picture of this. Um, of this uh, shirt here. So if you are a member of mm -hmm. the Mount Hood chapter of the Oregon Equestrian Trails, you could get one of these too, right? Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. yeah. So that's why you, you all know who, who's who. And they who. come yeah. in about 48 colors. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's great. Because <laughs> usually, you know, you get volunteer oh. shirts or whatever, yeah. <clears throat> excuse me, and they're always in white or something like that. But you, these are pretty, you know, these yeah. are nice. <laughs> and we also, and when people join OET, mm -hmm. we give them a, a book, and I mean, it's like this thick, yeah. and it tells about all the horse camps that oh. we've built in the state, and even some that are up in Washington, yeah. and all the trails, and so it tells you, you know, how to get to it, the level of the, like the camp, and, and of the, it, they rate the trails from a level one to a level six. Is that for difficulty five. to ride? Is that mm -hmm. Yeah, it just yeah. lets you know how difficult yeah. if you're a beginning, trail is going to uh, be. Horse person. Or if you're yeah. afraid of heights. <clears throat> yeah. 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 <laughs> Monica, could I mention a couple monetary figures of you, donations that we do? You absolutely may. Okay, so in 2018, um, in the state of Oregon, we gave out grants of $17,000 to various chapters for horse camps and trail oh, work. Okay. And the interesting thing about that, it, we have dues, and that all comes out of dues money. And then a lot of chapters do their own fundraisers so that they also put money toward horse camps and trails. And so for 2018, our group donated 12,134 hours in the state of Oregon. Wow, that's a lot. And that's just, just OET. And the total value of that is $748,634. 748, $634. That's a lot. And so, um, so we put our money where our mouth is. We don't yeah. do just the volunteer time, we also do cash. That's great. You know, we're we're out of time here, but I want to I do want to mention that um, that at your meetings you also um, have educational things like right. the, the Leave No Trace mm -hmm. um, that campaign that you have speakers and and other things like that, um, and that. Uh, if people want to get more information, they can go to your website, your Facebook page, mm -hmm. um, and you have newsletters and that kind of thing too, correct? Mm -hmm. Right. So um, the, the work you do, it sounds like it's important, but mm, maybe more importantly, it sounds fun. Yeah. But it's, 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 it's leaving a legacy for other uh, equestrians. So thank you for what you're doing, and thank you for being on a community hotline tonight. Thank it's you. really been thank a pleasure. You. Thanks. Do check them out on their website. We should have the uh, information on the screen. And if you're a horse lover or think you might want to check it out, go ahead and, and uh, find them on their website. I'm Monica Weitzel. Thanks for joining us tonight for Community Hotline. We'll see you next week. Community Hotline is made possible with generous support by Quick Lane, located at Gresham Ford. Life is better in the Quick Lane, now serving all makes and models, foreign and domestic. The Outlook, serving the residents of East Multnomah County for more than 100 years. 
the region's number one source for information, The Outlook provides readers with intensely local coverage of the issues and people that impact our lives and community. The Mount Hood Cable Regulatory Commission, advocating on behalf of the public interest on communications policy issues at the local, state, and federal levels. And by Stamp Connection and BeFit Gyms. A very special thanks to all the sponsors who help make our programming possible.